Very cool. We are now live. How are you guys? My name is Adam Dunlap. I'm the director of parkour.com. Super excited here to today to announce this new series we're going to do where we interview pros and parkour community leaders from around the world. I'm super, super humbled, humbled and honored to uh, bring Joey Adrian on the show today. So we have this cool Instagram feature where we can have multiple people on a live stream. So we're going to get Joey Adrian here. I'm going to invite him to the show right now. We're going to interview him with your questions. That's about a 30 minute interview. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. So here, let's let's dial him up and see. Oh, Joey, what's up, dude? Oh, How's it going? Time. hey, welcome. So excited to have you here. Here, let me yeah, try man, to... I'm pretty excited. You are the guinea pig, man. You're the guinea pig. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can how we can get spacing on here. Let's see. That's good enough. That's good enough for me. I don't need to be in the frame. Here we go. As you'll see, we want everyone to go follow you. Welcome oh, yeah. to oh, yeah. the welcome to the live stream today, to the interview. You are the first of a lot of pros. I mean, every week the whole idea would be to have a a pro or a community leader or someone who has a gym, somebody who's doing something in the parkour world, bring them on board and then hear their perspective on parkour and life and everything else. We are cool. we, sounds great. We're recording it. Uh, I have like a a microphone here that I'm recording as well, and so if the sound turns out, we'll also put it on like YouTube and Facebook, so people can view it there cool. as well. So that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little curious about how the sound is going to be, just because. Yeah. Who knows? But who you knows, know, dude. Who knows? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear, but I don't know if my snowball mic will pick it up. So we'll find out. Cool, man. Is there anything you want to... I know we didn't... Because it's like a live stream, we didn't get a chance to like powwow beforehand. Is there any questions you have before we get started? Um... No. No? I don't think so. All right. I mean... All right. What I'd I say think, is that... I mean, I don't... Cool. I mean, there's... Well, I, mean, I guess... I guess my... Yeah. I guess my one question would be like, did you check out the post that I did and pull any questions from there? Or is it just kind of like... Yep. Yeah, okay, went cool, through every cool. single. Because I was gonna say there was there's some pretty good ones. I pulled and I have every no idea how I'm gonna answer them because I didn't really think about it too much. But well, you know what? I'll tell you what. I outlined. I have like three pages here of kind of like questions, and I have like six categories from basic questions oh, we got, to. We got some, wait, we got somebody saying the mic is messed up. Is oh. it my mic? It's probably my mic. Can they not hear? I can hear you great. Okay, I can hear you fine. I can hear you. Great. It might be your voice coming through on my end in which case I'll grab some headphones that's weird uh, um, just cause I'm using like just my phone everything oh it sounds great alright we're good we're chilling cool let's all go right. man well I have I have all these different categories of questions some are more fun some are more clearly in categorized so I think we're just kind of just maybe see where it goes but the way I see it is you're the star here so I'm just here to ask you questions I don't really see it so much as a conversation, more as like interviewing you so people can hear your perspective and vision and experience and all those things. Cool? Cool. All right. I guess we'll start off with maybe the appropriate thing would be to introduce yourself, tell us how old you are, and how long you've been training. Yeah, I'm uh, Joey Adrian. I'm 26. I've been training for like eight and a half, nine years, somewhere around there. Um... I've been competing a lot. I've made a lot of videos. I just sat in water. That was really pleasant. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I've competed in most competitions, uh, at least the major international ones, and then most of the U.S. ones I've gone to. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been. I'm sponsored by Take Flight, obviously, um, as well as. Oh boy. You gotta, Take you Flight, you gotta, you gotta Team Geo, right, WFPF, Move to Inspire, um, I hope I'm not missing anybody, but I might be, uh, those those are the key ones, um, guys that I do a lot of work with is mainly WFPF, Move to Inspire, and, or sorry, WFPF, Take Flight, and Team Geo. Geo, for sure. But, yeah. You, you've done a lot, of, a lot more work with Geo than Take Flight. You went on a tour. Was it last summer that you guys yeah. did in Europe, like a van tour? Yeah, that was that was a few summers ago. Uh, it was it was me, Alfred, Thomas Shantz, Vova, uh, Corky, 
and Kyria. And I mean, we, we, we didn't have everybody for the whole flight. Oh, we had, we had a uh, Bjarke too, but, uh, we didn't have everybody for the entire tour. Uh, but yeah, Geo just kind of like flew us all out to Denmark. Actually, I think we were in Netherlands is where we started maybe. Uh, yeah, they flew us all out, gave us a van mm-hmm. and we're just like, all right guys, go for it. And there were a couple of events we knew we wanted to hit. Like we wanted to uh-huh. hit crap invaders. We wanted to hit for the love of movement. Um, Aside from that, it was pretty much just up to us to go wherever we wanted to go. Uh, and, I mean, Alfred, every, everybody has a huge following, Alfred especially, so he would just kind of post on Instagram and be like, yo, guys, we're heading in this direction. Who's over here that wants to train and can house us? Just go to their place, stay there for a couple days, and then move on to the next spot. That was, that was a really dope trip. I was hoping we could do it again this last year, but it just didn't quite line up. That's cool. Now, how, how did you find parkour and free running? You said like eight and a half, nine years that you've been doing it. How, wh- how did you uncover it? That's always the question we ask, you know? Hey, that's a great question. Um, kind of a weird story. So, I, I mean, when I was younger, like, I started when I was 18, I want to say. Um, huh. But yeah, when I was much younger, I liked to climb trees a lot, I liked to jump. You know, the whole story, everybody likes to do all that stuff. Um, but I really liked to do it. And I just really liked being athletic and moving around. Uh, had a bit of a rough patch for a while. And then really? I was just kind of at my house one day. Uh, my buddy Jeff, who lives like a block away from me, just kind of came up with his friend. And his friend had heard about parkour. Uh, and he showed me like a King Kong ball over <laughs> my mom's truck. And I was like, what is this? That's so cool. And he basically did a dive Kong over the like hood of her truck. And it was a big truck. And so I spent the better part of, like, two hours working on it. Finally ended up, like, after just drilling it and bailing and failing and crashing, ended up kind of doing, like, a double Kong step-down type situation. And I was like, wow, this is cool. He told me to look up parkour. I looked it up. I found Portland Parkour. uh, Joined up with them within the next week and a half or two weeks. Um, I I felt I was really kind of self-conscious about my skill at the time. And so before I went out with them, I, like, looked up all the basic vaults and uh. made sure I knew what things were called and <laughs> kind of tried to get myself up to date. And then I met up with them, and they were all super chill, like, taught me everything. And I ended up taking that over, like, a month or two later once uh, once the head of that ended up actually moving. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that's how it all started. And that's then I just kind of trained at least once a week from then on and mm-hmm. then started training, like, every single day. Not too long after that. When did you start to become serious about it? When did it become really something that you felt defined you? So this is something that I I usually only tell select people because oh. I feel like if the wrong people hear this, it's uh, they, they I don't think everybody should do this, and I don't think I should have done this. Mm-hmm. But pretty much after my first session with Portland Parkour, uh, we went out, we trained literally from 10 a.m. till it got dark and that was like 9 30 p.m. and I've never been as sore as that in my life I could not get out of bed the next day Um, but I loved it I loved it so much and I had literally nothing going for me at that point in my life that I was just like this is what I'm doing period Mm. there's nothing else it's this and so every chance that I could get out and train I would be I would be in my backyard like, drilling rolls over and over again because I was like, oh, I got to get a good roll because I can't, you know, I can't be an athlete. I don't have to be doing box jumps everywhere I could. Like, precisions weren't a big thing in my head at mm-hmm. the time, so I just drilled as many vaults as I could. Um, so, yeah, I, I started, like, pretty much from minute one, I was like, this is what I'm going to do, uh-huh. and that's that's it. And why don't – why is that something that you don't feel like other people should maybe do? Um, well, I feel like a lot of people kind of have that idea and they want to do that. Hmm. Um, but I had, I was really lucky in a bunch of different ways. One, my mom was super supportive. Uh, so I had a place to stay. Like I didn't have to like fend for myself or anything. So that was really lucky for me. Um, I basically like, I didn't, it was, to me, it wasn't like, if this fails, I'm screwed. And there are people that are in that situation where they really have to like, sure, balance training with making
making a living because that's not always possible. Um, I think for some people it's great, like hop on board, go 100%, give it your all. Mm -hmm. But if it starts to, you know, take over things that you have to do Mm -hmm. or that you you're basically required to do for a living, then that can start to be an issue. You know what I mean? So for you, it was it was like a job. It was like you took it on like that level of seriousness. Like I'm all in eight hours a day type thing for you. Pretty much, pretty much, and it was it was. It wasn't necessarily like, like that kind of makes it sound like it was work, <laughs> but it was it was just the only thing in my life at that time that like brought me joy. I mm-hmm. was like, this is the only thing that is fun for me, mm-hmm. and I got that kind of uh, fulfillment out of it yeah, totally. that I didn't get from anything else. And so all I wanted to do eight hours a day was train. That was it. And so that's just kind of how it went. Um, from there, like. Within, I was also lucky in the sense that there were parkour jobs to be had. Like Revolution Parkour, you you had started that already. Uh, Matt had just taken it over from you about I want to say a year after I started training. Um, and when he took it over, he was looking for new coaches. And so within that first year, I got a coaching job. Oh, wow. um, so yeah. I I could already see that path kind of unfolding for me. And so I knew if I just went all in and kept doing this, then that would be all I had to do, uh, more or less. <laughs> now, when you started, I do have this vague memory of the first time ever seeing you, and it was at the Revolution Parkour Gym, and I don't know if I was still involved with it or if it was after, but I remember seeing you jump like between two vaults and being like, whoa, that guy has some springs. Like there was that, there's that difference between being able to jump and then having like that little more distance where you're like, whoa, that person like is actually jumping. And you had that. And I've always wanted to know, and I'm sure other people want to know, did you feel like you had a physical proclivity for parkour? Like, were you coordinated? Did you have good hops? Or was it something that you really had to develop through your training? Uh, I definitely think it's both. Um, <laughs> for my height, I think I had great hops, but I, I would attribute a lot of that just to my early years. Like, I, I played soccer. So... It sounds kind of weird, but basically I always knew that I wouldn't have, like, a 9-to-5 job. Like, that was not what I was going to do. Huh. Uh, for me, from, like, really young, I there were three things that I wanted to do. I wanted to, and I wanted to do all three of them. Not just, like, oh, I want to do one of these three, but I was going to do th- all three of these things. I was going to be in the X, X Games for skating. Huh. I was going to be uh, in the World Cup for soccer. And then I was going to be in the Olympics for gymnastics. Now, this was before I knew about parkour. Uh, but those were the three things. And so as a kid, I was just super hyper. I loved to jump. I loved to just run around and go crazy. Mm-hmm. And so, and even like, as I started to get older, me and my buddy Jeff, like one of our favorite things to do was we would dress in all black and go out like at night in the winter. Mm-hmm. And our goal would be to have nobody see us. And we'd be dive rolling over these bushes. This was way before I knew about rolling. So we were basically just flopping over these bushes, like, (laughs) scrambling up trees. We were, like, these 12-year-olds just, like, running around doing these Black Ops missions. And we would set up, like, these giant barriers and just try to dive over them onto my bed. And so I just did a lot of jumping. (laughs) There's a lot of... I think a little bit... Yeah, yeah, I think a little bit is is that early on practice. So I was just used to jumping. um, Where I know a lot of people that I talk to now are just, like... Yeah, as a kid, I just kind of sat around and played video games. Mm. And so they never really got that, like, I'm a kid, I'm jumping, I'm playing, I'm active outside. But I had a lot of that, and I played a lot of soccer, um, skated all the time, so yeah. Cool. I want to ask you, I want to move to competitions, because clearly it seems like videos seem, at least in the past, put most people on the map. Uh, I think no question for you, videos put you on the map. But then it was competitions that I think people started to realize even more so. Whoa, Joey Adrian's special. So I wanted to know if you can rattle off in some way like your competition resume. Like the, the times that you've played. Like do you have that in your mind of like all the events you've placed at? I mean you've kind of, you've competed all over. You competed at the Red Bull San, Santorini a couple times. Two times? Three times? Yep. You, two I'm, times. Two times. NAPC. Um, I mean you've NAPC, done an air whip. I've been done, there. Uh, so let's see. So, so 
I will name some of them that are like the most noteworthy, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, I placed first and second at Air Whip. I placed Ooh. third at Art of Motion. I placed uh, first at NAPC three times and third once. Um, and then there were other various competitions here and there that I've done well at. Uh, the, the WFPF Jump Off, mm -hmm. the World Championships, uh, I placed first there <laughs> yeah, and then second that. on this last round. Um, so yeah, I've done, I've done a lot of competitions. I've placed pretty well at a lot of them too. Now, in discussions that we've had in the past, you mentioned how you felt like you went to these competitions and you said to me, and if, if this is wrong, correct me, but you said to me that you felt like there were people that were better than you that didn't place as high as you. And you, you seem oh, to yeah. credit that towards how you approach competitions. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, there's legitimately not a single competition that I've competed in where I have thought that I was the best athlete. Like, mm. not a single one. Mm. Um, I would say there's, on average, five to ten people that I would put at a higher skill level than me at every single competition. And a lot of the times I'm taking first, second, third, above, a, like, seven or eight of these other athletes. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, and I think a lot of that is contributed, one, my training style just fit competition format um i've always liked to train long lines like i said when i was a kid i loved running around i loved being active that kind of went into my early days of training mm -hmm. that mixed with my my best training partner that i've ever had sam stringer when we first met i was 18 and he was 12 mm -hmm. we had this really weird communication barrier where we neither of us were comfortable talking to the other one so what we did is I would pick up my phone or I would pick up my camera and I would point it at him. He would do a line. As soon as he was done with it, he would grab the camera from me, point it at me, and then I would do a line. And we would do that for like seven straight hours. Wow. Like barely any talking, just laughing and moving. Um, and yeah. so that kind of built up this idea in my head of every move that I do is a transition to the next move. Mm -hmm. And then taking that and just doing that style in competition mm -hmm. has proven to do really well for me where a lot of other people I think try these individual moves and they're really focused on getting super good at this move and super good at this move and then in the competition when they have to put it together that's not their normal training mm -hmm. it's just they're like well I'm used to doing this and this and this but now the difficult part is putting it together for me I will learn a move at the competition and then it'll instantly like that click with the rest of my moves because I'm used to putting them together uh, so it's, it's a different training style and like some people would argue that that would just make me a better athlete or a stronger athlete in that sense. I don't think so. I think it's just an under appreciated skill that if any other person who has these, these higher skill levels than me that I talk about guys, like I could name like a hundred of them right now, but instead of that, uh, if any of them really just put a focus on connecting lines more and less on learning new moves, they would just skyrocket above everybody. Hmm. Maybe maybe it's just a natural talent of mine that I feel like comes easier than it does to other people, but I don't know. Now, you did you created a presentation for this for Team Geo, right? I remember you in a Geo uh, t-shirt on it with an interview, but I haven't seen it. Where can people watch this? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, for Jump Fest, actually. Oh, okay. And it should be on... Oh, boy, I should know the website, but I don't know the website. Uh, if you go to the Jump Site or Jump Fest uh, Facebook page and go to that website, it'll be there. You have to pay for it, though. Not sure how much it is, hmm. um, but it is there. I think it's a great, a great talk, great presentation. Uh, if anybody's here to take competition seriously, definitely give that a listen. And you, what do you I talk about? A lot out of it. What do you talk about in that, Josh? Oh man! Uh, so, so the speech was, or the the presentation was basically about everything competition related. And I'm talking mm -hmm. mentality, physical training for it, um, starting from what do I? 
starting from the very beginning of should I compete? Is competition right for me? Is it not right for me? The the things that you have to look into, what you want to get from parkour and whether competition will give that to you or whether you should go a different route. And then we talk about literally from five, six months away from the competition, how you should physically and mentally prepare all the way up until the day of and on the day of what I think you should be doing. Oh, wow. So you take that all into consideration. When you know you have an event coming up in, in five months, you actually thinking about that five months out? So personally, I don't. And mm-hmm. this is something that I talk about in the presentation. Um, like I said, a lot of these things just come naturally to me with mm-hmm. how I train. Um, and so what I ended up doing is I just really looked into my own training style and how I train. Now, I would say about two weeks away from a competition is when I start like being like, oh, wow, I have a competition coming up. Hmm. And that's when I start to think about it. Um, but before that, I, I don't think about it too much. But the thing is, the way that I train is already preparing me for the next competition, if that makes sense. It makes total so sense. I just, makes total sense. Yeah, so I just dug into that, um, asked a lot of people around me and kind of paid attention to what I was doing, what I was thinking, and how I was preparing, aka training, and how that affected my competition results. Um, and once I did that, I was like, oh, this is a pretty solid system. Um, there were a couple things that I was like, you know what? You should do this. I don't do this. I think if I did, it would make me a stronger competitor. It's just not something that interests me. Um, so it's here if you want to do it. If not, you can go my route. If not, go your own route. What is your biggest accomplishment in the parkour freerunning world? That's a, that's a good question. Um, for me, my biggest accomplishment, man. I don't know. That's a hard one. Hmm. I don't I don't think too much about accomplishments. Uh, for me, it's just every single day being able to like do something that I love and not have to worry about anything else that's the biggest thing to me um i know for for a little bit i was like see see your brain kind of changes after you've done things you know what i mean and so now that i've done a lot of these things they don't feel like accomplishments and they don't feel like things that if i erased my memory and like or didn't erase my memory if i kept all my memory and went way back they aren't things that i would be wanting to do anymore uh, so, for instance, going and competing at Art of Motion was, like, a big one for me. I was like, oh, that would be so amazing to be able to do that. And then I went there, I competed, and I was like, okay, this was cool, but it's just another competition. It's not a big deal. Huh. Um, and it was kind of like that with a lot of the, a lot of the physical accomplishments, uh, purely physical ones, and even some of the mental ones. Like, once I did it, I was just like, oh, that's not a big deal. And then I just kind of moved on. Huh, which is um, fascinating. That's really fascinating. And it, yeah, so it's, so it's hard to kind of look back on those and be like, well, this was a big accomplishment that I'm super proud of because now it's just like, it happened, I learned some stuff, it's cool, mm. that happened. That's a great answer. Do we, I have a couple things we could do. We could have, I have these rapid fire questions where we try to ask you as many questions as we can like in, in one minute. We have a bunch of deep questions about you and your training, and then we have fan questions. Which one of those would you like to do? Any oh category? man, um, all of them? I all don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we can um, we can talk for probably we're about twenty five minutes in, and I don't really know how long these should go. Like I would do these for two hours with people, like the Joe Rogan podcast, but I don't know if people will watch. So my thought was to try to I keep have them no shorter. Idea. But well, let's do um, let's do fan questions then. There's some good fan questions, right, that you, and you mentioned those being good, and there's some good ones that I think will provide a lot of value for a lot of people. So as you know, we polled people on the parkour.com Instagram, you polled people, and we took those questions. So here's a, a question from Matt Gassell. He says, he's actually from Oregon. He says, who's your favorite free runner? Who do you like? <laughs> All right, and, and maybe another way, like you have a lot of fans, right? So like, who are you a fan of? And I have to imagine that maybe there's more than one person, but is there anyone or a couple of people that stick out in your mind like, man, I watch every video from those guys. They inspire me. Is there anything like that that you have? That is that is a hard question. And that's one of the <laughs> ones that I saw and I was just like, man, I don't even want to think about this. <laughs> um, so, all right. Here's the problem 
doing short interviews. I talk a lot, so I apologize for that. It's okay. But, uh, right. so, I could name, like, 30 people that inspire the hell out of me. Mm. Um, trying to narrow down my, my top ones, that's really difficult. Mm. Um, mm. Off the top of my head, obviously, Alfred Scott, he's a huge one. Um, Nate Weston, Sean Bautista, uh, let's see, Didi is, like, one of my all-time favorites, and I think he is literally the best in the world. Really? Uh, if it, yeah, if, it, if I had to if I had to nail it down, I'd have to give Didi the best in the world. Now, I think if he if he like went hard and took it seriously, uh, and I know he did back in the day. I think he's chilling out and really focusing on coaching right now. Mm. Um, but if he ever got the like competition bug in him, or the like just I want to be the best in the world bug I think he would easily be the best in the world like he has really? so many different talent yeah well he got injured um, didn't he didn't he get hurt there's guys like DK too and yeah. Christian Kovaleski and a bunch of local guys that, that, that just, there's so many dude. a lot of people it's so hard it's impossible it is. It's. It's interesting comparing it to like a world that's like it's more organized, like soccer or the NBA or something, where there's like a, a limited group of people. But in the poker world, there's like no limits. Like if you rise to a high level, then respect. Yeah. yeah. Well, then how about this? Another question, Blade Kelso from Idaho. If you could explain your style in one word, what would it be? Ooh, lines. Lines. That's it. Lines. Lines, yeah. That's what I love. That's what I do. That's my style. All right. Another question. How about from uh, Saman Sharashtani? He's 13 years old, lives in Las Vegas. What is your take on learning scary moves? How do you do that? How do you approach that? Great question. Um, yeah. First of all, Krusty the Cat, just chilling. Yeah, he's been behind uh, you a bunch today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so say that again. Learning, learning scary moves. Sorry. Yeah. How would you? What is your take on learning scary moves, whether outside or inside? He also goes on to say, how do you approach putting big moves into your flowy lines? Like I've seen you do some stuff Perfect. with like double backs and stuff like that. Big question. That's 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 another thing that I go over a lot in that. Uh, in that presentation mm. is is how to put your lines together and how to mentally think about lines and line preparation, all of that stuff. Uh, but quickly, uh, so approaching scary moves, first of all, mm. for me, it's just all about breaking it down into progressions. Easy peasy, break it down, break it down, break it down. Also, pretty much every scary move, you'll hit a point where you can't really add another progression in. You know what I mean? Like that right. point where, okay, I have to go over my head. I have to actually throw this now. And for me, what I like to do is two things. One, I never I never worry about time. Like I know a lot of people are like, I have to hit this within the next three tries. Mm. And I think, I, I'm not even going to say that's a bad way of training. If it works for you, that's great. Hit it up, do your thing. For me, I don't like it because... If I'm not ready in those three tries, I, I like to take all the time in the world. If I need extra time, I'm going to take it. I'm going to throw it to my back on the mats over and over and over and over and over until I know for a fact nothing's ever going to go wrong, and then I commit to the move. Hmm. Now, past that, once I've committed to the move, there's a few things that I like to do to now take that to my lines. First off, if I can commit to the move quickly, like let's say... It takes me five seconds from getting in the position to do the move to doing the move, right? So if I uh, if I was doing like a cast full, if I went up to the to the support position mm -hmm. and then counted one, two, three, four, five, and then can do the move, immediately after that I stop doing the move by itself. I put it directly into a line, and I have a Whoa. kind of a three step progression for it. Whoa. Step number one, I start with the move and then do a line after that. Once I'm getting comfortable with that, I then do the li do the move at the end of a line. So I'll do two, three moves up into the cast position, cast full. Um, and then finally, I'll put it smack in the middle and try to do it without any hesitation. Whoa. And so that's kind of how I, how I break it down from like a power move or like 
super scary move to now it's just another move in the line. Um, and that, that makes it really nice for converting that to like a competition or to taking it outside. Because if I can do this move in the middle of a difficult line, in the middle of 10 other moves, taking that move to concrete is nothing because now I just have to do it myself. Sorry, that's my dog, Tess. She's very old. She's like, hi, Tess. Is that you? Is that you? Oh, there you are. Okay. There you are, little boy. Sorry. Oh, hey. Um, but yeah, so that's so that makes it easy for me to take the move to concrete with the move in a in a competition line. However, it's got to go next. That's how I do it. So then, overcoming that, you said every move gets to that point where, like, I got it. I got to go for it, right? And you said time wasn't something that that you didn't put time limits on yourself. But is anything like when does does that time limit ever just stretch so long that you're like it becomes like you're slacking? Like, has that time limit ever been like it's been two weeks? I know I can do it, and I haven't done it yet. What is that malleability um, of the time fear spectrum like? Not really. For me, really? Uh, it's it's either something that I'm interested in and I'm going to do it, or I lose interest and I stop caring about it until the next time I want to do it. Hmm. Uh, so, I, like like I said, for me, like moving is the exciting thing. Doing lines is the exciting thing for me. Um, getting individual moves sometimes is a big motivation for me, but... If it's taking me, like, if it's this huge mental block for me, well, let me say this. Things don't get to a huge mental block for me. If it's a mental block and I am having a hard time doing it, I'm just like, eh, not today. Walk away, do some other stuff, and then come back to the next day, try it again. And before it gets to that point of, like, I'm going to kill myself if I don't do this next, like, I know a lot of people get really frustrated and really just drill out the move and only focus on that move till they get it, I get to that point where I either know I'm going to do it or I know I'm not going to do it. If I know I'm going to do it, then it's just a matter of, ah, I'll just keep working at it until I get bored. As soon as I'm bored, I move on or I wow. hit it. If I know I'm not going to do it, I just leave it for another day. Wow. It's like you never let it get to like that insurmountable mental place. Exactly, and I think I think a lot of people have their own ways of like kind of dealing with that. Um, but for me, I would say probably three years ago, I had a little bit of an issue with some stuff like that, and it just caused like stress when I was training. You know what I mean? Mm. I'd think about doing these moves, or like I'd want to go to the gym, but I'd be like, ah, I don't know, man. If I go to the gym, or if I if I get up on this block, then I have to do this double gainer, or like whatever it is. You know what I mean? And it just caused a lot of stress. And then I looked at that and I was like, well, training isn't fun anymore. <laughs> Let me not focus on this. And training got a lot funner. And then I started doing all the moves that I wanted to do just because if it was fun and I wanted to do it, I would do it. If it wasn't, I would do something else. I've never heard anyone explain that. I super admire you for that. That's really cool. Really cool. <laughs> uh, what a great way to approach things. I have another question from Charles Lucas. He says, how has parkour changed in your opinion over the years? That's part one. Then I'll ask you part two of his question. How has parkour changed oh, in your man. opinion over the years? It's changed a lot. Um, so so there's something that I think about a little bit or quite a bit and something that me and my buddy Daniel, who's a roommate of mine, we talk about quite a bit too. Um, so back in the day, I'm just going to speak for for myself and what I've experienced. I can't talk on other experiences or the parkour community as a whole. It would just be my interpretation of how things have changed. It wouldn't be how things have changed. You know what I mean? So it's right. not really fair to put that out there. Um, but for me, like back in the day, it was all about just like super fun, go out with all my friends and then train all day. Not a care in the world is all I want to do. Over the years, like, people start falling off, people stop training, new new generations come in with these new mindsets, and what I'm seeing more and more of is this mindset of, I want to be good, slash, I have to be good, mm. instead of, we're just going to go out, find some challenges, and have fun, um, and that's in, in my life, what I've noticed with people that I train with. Mm. Um, not everybody's like that, obviously, 
but that's a big a big shift and i've noticed a lot of people i feel like are feeling that way due to videos and competitions and things like that and they're starting to train for those things like oh i really want to get this for instagram or i really want to get this so i can do it in my run at this competition um and that didn't used to exist too much with the people that I trained with. Um, we all wanted to get better for random reasons, but it wasn't like we have to get better, we have to be good. You know what I mean? So I feel like that's that's kind of been a, a shift in the mindset and the training mentality around me personally. Fascinating. Which, again, not, not necessarily good or bad. Like, that's great. The sport's pushed. Um, if people are staying happy and training hard and having fun, doing you know trying to push themselves to get better that's great i think it becomes a problem when it it turns into stress and it turns into like all this negativity building up because either they're not getting better or it's going slower than they want and you know we've sure. all experienced that so. sure well i mean especially back in the days like 20 years ago before there was any videos there was like no one knew what was even possible but now that everyone yeah. sees it it's like you know, or then there's someone that's five years younger than you that's better than you, and you're like, "What? Like, why is this twelve year old better than me?" And you're just like, "Ah, oh. I mean, there's a lot more pressure, but there's also a lot more opportunity, I think, financially and yeah. and such." Which brings us to the next question, Charles. Well, that's, also, that's another thing too, yeah, real ahead, quick. Is uh, there's so many gyms now. Yeah. Nobody comes and trains outside. I remember oh. we were just talking about this the other day, dude. We used to get out all the time. If it was raining, we just do some like some hardcore training sessions like hit it like warriors and we'd have like a little group with us it was dope now everybody's just like oh it's raining i'm going to the gym which is fine but like i don't know i love outdoor training so yeah uh i mean there's gyms now you're right <laughs> that's a big change <laughs> and you can like set up you can set up what you, the jump you want to do right like in the old yeah. days, I'll jump in for a quick second. In the old days, it's like you had to like find it. You had to like, I got to find a place where I can do an underbar. And then all of a sudden one day you would like find it. And you're like, oh my gosh, like I, I found a place. Now it's like, oh, let me like change the bar set up. Like, let me put a mat here. Let me like change the distance between this Kong. You know what I'm saying? And you can progress to it. You can make it an eight foot Kong and yep. a nine foot Kong and a 10 foot Kong. In the old days, you just find like a 12 foot Kong and you're like, good luck. You know, go figure it out. Uh, <laughs> very astute, man. Very astute. The gym. Well, here's the other question Charles Lucas asked. He said, on top of that, do you think one day athletes will be able to make a living off the sport? And how far is that away? And some people maybe are right now, obviously. Yeah. I, I definitely think that one day people will be able to make a living off the sport. Um, I would say that this, this is kind of the thought that I've had for a while now. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to stick with it for now without thinking about it too much. Um, things are happening. Maybe it'll come a little bit sooner. Who knows? Um, but the generation that is just starting right now, like people that are just starting right now, are probably not going to make a good living off of parkour. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to do kind of what we're doing right now, which is finding other other outlets. I think there will be a better, like more money within parkour to make a living. Um Obviously, through coaching would be a big one, um, possibly through competitions as well as sponsors. But I think the, the generation after the one like that's just starting right now is where people will be making money. So maybe seven to ten years, uh, it'll be a pretty good chance of if you're really good, you're probably going to be set. Hmm. But uh, right now, you have to be really good at parkour and really good at about 10,000 other things, and <laughs> right. then you <laughs> right. might be set. <laughs> right. Everyone's, there's so many people that are so multi-talented. You know, one yeah. person that comes to mind is, is Alex. I And I can't pronounce the last name. Alex Schauer or something? How do you say Alex that? Alex Schauer. Alex Schauer. Man, he's so talented yeah. in so many ways besides yeah. just movement. And you're like, well, well, there you go, you know. But like. Exactly. But he's got like all these talents. And you're like, oh my gosh. All right, man. You're a prodigy, I guess. Let's see. Yeah, seriously. Any other good questions? Okay, we'll end with a question from Oren Deckel. He says, "This could be a this could be a one sentence answer, Joey. It could be like a, you know, a page." Real yeah. quick, real yeah, quick, yeah. real quick. Yeah. I just saw in in the comments somebody said Dom Tomato. I just want to give a quick shout out to Dom Tomaso because 
he, like, dude has been putting in so much work and progressing so much. Like, he's one of those guys that is just, like, I saw him a couple years ago at events, and I was like, wait, you can't do this? You can't do that? Like, you can just do mm-hmm. big fronts? Like, you're you're cool, but, like, what? And then literally every single day he's just putting in mad work and training super hard. So he, he's been inspiring me like crazy lately, just watching how often he's out and like seeing in Sweden, he was like training every day. And then every night he was like editing vlogs and stuff. And I was like, man, he is putting in work. So that's inspiring too. Keep going. Very cool. No, Dom's great. Dom is really inspiring. Oren Deckel says, what's your best advice for parkour and free running. Best advice for parkour and free running would have to be if you're not having fun with it, do something else. That would, that would be it. Uh, I see too many people that get down on themselves while training. Hmm. Um, stop, stop really having fun through training and they just try to push through it instead of like taking a step back and doing something else for a minute. Like I went through this big depression state probably like two years ago now, three years ago maybe. Um, for like three, four months, I just was having a terrible time training. I hated it, but I was like, well, if I don't train, then I'll regret not training once I like step out of this funk. So I just kept training, kept training, kept training. And then one day I was like, dude, this sucks. And all I wanted to do was play video games. So I stepped away. I played video games for two days straight. And on the third day, I woke up and I was like, holy shit, I need to train. I need to train now. And then went right back to training. And it was like the best thing ever for the next three years up till now. You know what I mean? And I think think it's important. Like if if you're not having fun with it, you're not passionate about it anymore, just take a step back. And that might be what you need to hop right back into it. Or you're going to find something else that you're passionate about and just hop on that. You know what I mean? That's great advice. That's like, that seems like On top of that, like something that, I mean, everybody that knows me has heard me say this. Probably not a lot of other people have heard me say this. Um, And it might be like a controversial thing. I don't know. Hmm. But like everybody's so parkour for life, free running for life. You know what I mean? And that's great. Like, I, I'm into that. But at the same time, like, I've, I've said it before. I'll say it all the way up until I die. If there's something that I find I'm more passionate about than parkour, that I love doing more than parkour, I'm going to drop parkour and I'm going to do that. Like, even if even if my entire living is doing parkour, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's all about what you're passionate about and what you love doing, for me, anyways, personally. Um, for me, that's been parkour. Um for other people that are doing parkour right now for you it might be it might be chess but you're so like in this mindset of parkour for life you don't want to step back and play some chess with a friend and be like oh my god this is actually what i love and i want to do this for the rest of my life you know what i mean do you consider yourself a spiritual person joey uh, a little bit a little bit Sp- yeah yeah spiritual would be the word but uh, what about not religious? What about deep thinker? Are you a deep thinker? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. From you know, I haven't spent a ton of time with you, but from the time I have spent with you, I've started to observe that you don't talk that much. But then when you do talk, I perceive that you put a lot of thought into what you say. So you like turning I, I these would, ideas? I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there are some times that I get on tangents where I'm just like talking and I'm like, oh God, I need to stop talking. But I get I get really excited about certain topics and my brain just doesn't shut off. Uh-huh. What excites you outside of the parkour world? Well, the big one, uh, well, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that really? excites me. Um, really? The big one that I love doing outside of parkour, aside from parkour, is I love playing League of Legends. As uh, as ridiculous as that might sound, but uh, I've definitely like, right. and again, this might sound ridiculous, but I've learned a lot from playing League and like a lot of uh, uh, people skills from playing League. As weird as that sounds, just like dealing with people, because a lot of people get super tilted and upset, and it's it gets me thinking about 
the mindsets that people have going into things um, and like how to talk to people who are super upset to kind of calm them down and relax them and get them to focus on the goal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one that I love. Uh, another one is just like nature, anything nature related, really? like going hiking, going uh, nature watching, going to the zoo, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I just really like nature. What's the future, Joey, for you? What, what, we're we're going to kind of wrap this thing up. What is the future yeah. for Joey Adrian? What do you see in your future? What would you like to do? What are you working towards? What do you see? There's a lot of things uh, that I'm working towards and that I hope happen in the future and where I kind of want to see myself go. Uh, one, I've been saying this for a while, but competing is not as interesting to me as it used to be. I've done a lot of competing. A lot of my thought process has gone into competing. um, And it's just, I feel feel like I've gotten what I needed to get out of doing a lot of competitions. um, And I want to kind of phase out of competing, more or less. Uh, I'm still going to compete this year. Uh, If people invite me to stuff, I'm probably going to go compete. Uh, but the big thing that I want to that I want to move on to is helping. And this was a question that somebody brought up: is people making a living off of parkour? I want to help facilitate that in the future, in the sense that for me, still having this, you know, looking at competitions and thinking about them a lot. The two biggest things that I see holding competitions back from being like next level are good commentators is number one because I think if you watch any other sport without commentators it's like ah this is okay to watch but then you add the commentators and you're like this is dope I, I'm into this it yeah. bumps it up to that next level totally. parkour you watch it without commentators you're like yo this is sick like you put a music track on you're like yo this is sick and then you add our commentators and with the with the exception of like a couple people like I think Frosty does a really good job Frosty's great um uh, Travis does a pretty good job most of the time. Um, it, it's not perfect, though. You know what I mean? Um, but with tough, the exception man. of those it's people, tough. like, Oof. yeah, you put that commentary on, and it's like, I don't really care to watch this anymore. I'm not excited by it. Mm. Um, so I think in order for, for parkour competitions to go to that next level, we need good commentators. And in order for that to happen, events need money to pay the commentators not only to do their job, which is obviously being there and, and talking about the competition, right? But they need to be paid before the event starts so that they can do research totally. on the athlete totally. and have things to say during the downtime, not just kind of BSing stuff until, you know. So I think that's number one. Totally. Number two is um, a better judging format, like a mm. solid, complete judging format. Mm. And we're still experimenting with those, so that could wait. But commentary, like, that's really what I want to dive into, and I want to get good at it so that competitions are exciting to watch. Viewers come. We have more eyes on the competition, which means more sponsors are going to be in, in are interested in sponsoring the event, which means the people competing can now make a living off of doing parkour. But It's all an industry, and there's so many pieces. You know, and there's some yeah. pieces that are there, and then some pieces that aren't there. I think the athletic piece is there. The athletes are so okay. good, but then you have some other elements that haven't quite. But that's just the part of growing. And I think you'd be a great commentator. I would love to see you commentate. And one thing that's cool about that is you can do it for a long time. So maybe exactly. in, maybe in 20 years you'll be like commentating on the Olympics or something like that. You know, which would just be amazing. I hope in 20 years I'm still able to go to competitions, go to events. And participate in some way you know what I mean that's that's the goal right now because as as my as I get too old to like compete at a high level I still want to be a part of these competitions and I still be helping out and facilitating these athletes so that they can make a living off of it even when I'm like a crusty old you know <laughs> <laughs> even when the, the joints don't work anymore or something I don't know but no, uh, exactly. you'll, I'm sure the way you move, Joey, I'm sure you'll be able to move for a long time, a long, long, long time to come. So some people, if you take care of your body, that thing lasts. 
and people are showing it now. We see it like in professional sports like LeBron James, but then we see it in people like David Bell who are 40 and can still do huge jumps. And right. you seem to be someone who really takes care of your body. So I wouldn't, I mean, I expect to see you being able to do some stuff for a, for a couple decades. That's the hope right there. <laughs> we'll see. To close it out, is there anything you want to say or talk about? Anything you want to announce? Anything that's on your mind? Anything, anything at all? Um, man, oh man, oh man. I don't know. I, I, for anybody who's left watching, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us uh, talk about stuff. That's dope. Uh, I want to thank anybody who's a follower slash fan of mine because it's really cool. It means a lot every time like I post something and then people watch it. I know that mm. sounds stupid because I have like a, like a decent amount of followers, but like it's so cool to like post a thing and then see that people enjoy watching it if that makes mm. sense like and hearing people are inspired by it to go and you know do their thing go out and train go out and be outside you know what i mean that's amazing that's the coolest thing in the world so thank you guys all for that uh i think that's it though all right well hey i think people love you joey and I thought about this, I'm like, why do people like Joey so much? And I'm like, I think it's because he works hard, because he stays humble. He's a happy person. So I think as much as you feel blessed by people watching you, I'm pretty sure people feel even more blessed by you being around. So thanks for bringing that to the parkour world and the world at large. And we'd love to have you back. Anytime you want to talk about anything, anything anytime you want to announce something, something happens in your life, something happens, maybe you get a commentator job or something, let us know. We'd love to have you back. We'd love to talk to you anytime on parkour.com. And if there's anything we can do to support you as well, let us know. Whether that means sharing your content or helping you in some way, just let us know. Perfect. Sounds great. I would definitely love to be back because I love talking about parkour stuff. And uh, we always have. We always seem to have really good conversations. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being our guinea pig. <laughs> and hey man, no flowing problem. with these questions and so man we we could have, we could be here for another two hours I have so many other questions we didn't ask you that are really fun but uh, we'll save it for the next time so yeah sounds good everybody if you're still watching please tell me you're following Joey Adrian if you're not go follow him right now you're the one person Joey that like I watch every video you you post every single one other people sometimes you're just like the perfect balance of like not posting too much, right? And it's tough because yeah. there's that balance of like, if you post more, you get more followers, more people see you, but then sometimes some of your core followers are like, I don't want to see this person every day in my life. But right. You like somehow have that humble balance of like, just being you, and it's awesome. So thanks for that, dude. Yeah, man, that's what I, that's what I do best. I'll be me. <laughs> be you. Guys, go follow Joey. He's a great person, great tracer, and hopefully we're going to see a lot of things from you in the future. Thanks again, dude. All right, cool, man. Thanks a lot, Adam. We'll see you around. Take care. See you later. And that is the end of the interview with Joey Adrian. Thank you, for everybody, for tuning in. If you want to be on the show, let us know. That was the guinea pig episode, and we'd love to talk with more great people. we got a couple people lined up. I'm not going to say names, but some really, really uh, historic figures and some very talented tracers in the world today that have said, sure, I'll be on the show. And we'd love to continue bringing great tracers and great information to the to what I hope to be like a program of sorts, a series of sorts. And I think we'll get there. So like I said, if you haven't followed Joey, go follow that man. Check out his work. He works with some array, amazing organizations, GEO, Move to Inspire, WFPF. Uh, works with Take Flight. He works with lots and lots of people. And I think he's one of those guys that everybody wants to work with because he's just that type of guy. So go check him out. And also follow us at parkour.com. we got a website, parkour.com. It's kind of in development, but our social media is getting there. So parkour, D-O-T-C-O-M. You'll find us on Instagram. Check us out. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.